Good evening and welcome to the sixth annual Adler Lecture at the Coeur d'Alene Public Library. As a courtesy to our speaker, please take a moment and silence your cell phones and other devices. I am David Townsend, Communications Coordinator for the Library, and I'm filling in this evening for Mike Kennedy, who would normally serve as the MC representing the Idaho Humanities Council. Mike is not able to be here this evening due to a family event. Our lecture this evening is made possible by a grant from the Idaho Humanities Council, the state-based affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, without which many library programs in our communities throughout the state would not be possible. Our program is also sponsored by the Friends of the Library who are, who are providing our refreshments this evening, and by the Coeur d'Alene Press and CDA TV, which is broadcasting this event live. Copies of the lecture will also be available to check out at the library and to stream via our YouTube channel. Our thanks to our producer, Jeff Crow, for making this wide distribution possible. After the lecture this evening, we will have an you will have an opportunity to ask some questions. Our speaker, David Adler, is, a pres is president of the Alturist Institute, a nonprofit organization created to promote civic education and civil dialogue. He has taught courses on the Constitution and the Supreme Court at all three universities in Idaho. He has held the Andrus Professorship at Boise State University and the McClure Professorship at the University of Idaho, where he held a joint appointment in the College of Law and Department of Political Science. Previously, he was Professor of Political Science and Director of the Center of Constitutional Studies at Idaho State University. He remains an adjunct professor of law at the University of Idaho College of Law. A recipient of teaching, civic, write and writing awards, and internationally, he has lectured nationally and internationally on the Constitution, presidential powers, and the Bill of Rights. He has delivered more than 500 public lectures throughout Idaho and writes frequent op-ed pieces for newspapers across the state. He has brought us the Adler Lectures each year since 2012. Dr. Adler is the author of more than 100 scholarly articles, essays, and book chapters, and has written numerous books on the Constitution and presidential powers. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Adler. Thank you, David, for that very kind introduction. I want to thank D Dave Townsend and, of course, Mike Patrick for once more arranging this annual spring lecture. It's a rite of passage, it seems, as though that's the case. And it's always a great joy to return to this beautiful library and this beautiful city. And there's nothing like this view uh, as I stand behind the podium. So it is indeed a great pleasure to return. And it's so nice to see so many uh, familiar phrases to uh, greet old friends and to make new friends and thanks to everybody for coming out tonight. I'm so sorry that the subject that I was going to talk about is uninteresting <laughs> and, and nothing to say about that any longer. You know with President Trump the truth is that I've had to revise my talk about six times and indeed several times just today. It's hard to keep up with his tweets it's hard to keep up with the official White House explanation, which varies from half hour to half hour. And so it keeps you on your toes, and it's not easy to prepare for a talk like this. But I'll, I'll see what I can come up with tonight. One of my great uh, heroes from the American Revolution was Thomas Paine. I'm sure that you all admire him very much. And in one of his great books on the American crisis, he told Americans that these are the times that try men's souls. And you may recall that in that wonderful essay that he went on to distinguish between summer soldiers and winter soldiers. The winter soldiers are the true patriots who would bear any circumstances, meet any challenges in order to achieve their goals. The summer soldiers, those that are are those that duck and run and retreat from the challenges. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I think we live in a time in which all Americans should be prepared to be winter soldiers because we are in the midst of a very deep constitutional crisis, the kind of crisis that we've not seen in this nation since President Nixon held the Oval Office in the early 1970s and finally relinquishing the office with his resignation on August 9, 1974. To make that statement is to make quite a statement. But the reality is that when President Trump fired FBI Director James Comey, he in effect engaged in a very serious effort, I believe, to scuttle a very serious investigation into the possible collusion between Russian officials and the Trump campaign team. To even st to stand before you and to even speak about that subject is deeply troubling because we here in America have never had to face the possibility that a presidential campaign team might have at least cooperated with our greatest foreign adversary in a way that would affect the outcome of the election. Because when we think about foreign meddling, and that is a fact, all 17 of our national intelligence agencies have agreed that the Russians meddled in our election, that is uh, nothing less than an attack on America. We usually think about attacks on America in terms of missiles or bombs or bullets. But this attack was no less substantial in the sense that it was a direct assault on America's sovereignty. It was a direct assault on the most fundamental, the most foundational element of our democracy. And that is our ability as democratic citizens to choose our leaders free of foreign intervention, free of foreign interference, free of foreign meddling. And when we talk about the prospect, or indeed in this case, the fact of foreign meddling, we have to recognize what a direct threat that is to the system created by James Madison and Alexander Hamilton. Americans have prided themselves for more than 200 years on our ability to engage in free, fair elections to choose our leaders. That is the essence of our right as sovereign citizens. So when we think about the fact that a foreign nation has meddled, and when we consider the possibility, as the Senate Intelligence Committee is considering, as the House Intelligence Committee is considering, as the FBI is considering, that members of President Trump's campaign team may well have cooperated or indeed colluded with Russian officials to affect the outcome of the election, that sends chills down our collective spine because we wonder at what point then do Americans lose their free and independent right to choose their leaders. Thus it is that we've been plunged into this very deep constitutional crisis. And the comparisons to the Nixon White House are no exaggeration. When Americans learned that in fact President Trump had fired FBI direct, Director Comey, scholars across the nation, political pundits, analysts on the networks quickly hearkened back to the, to the Saturday Night Massacre on October 19, 1973, when President Nixon ordered the Attorney General to fire the Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox. Elliot Richardson, a man of great integrity, refused to do so because he understood that President Nixon was attempting to scuttle the investigation known as Watergate. And then when the next guy in line, the Associate Deputy Attorney General in the Department of Justice, Ruckelshaus, William Ruckelshaus, was asked to do it and he refused, he was fired by President Nixon. Finally, President Nixon, after going down the line, found an Assistant Attorney General who was willing to fire Archibald Cox. His name was Robert Bork the same Robert Bork who would later be nominated by President Reagan for a seat on the Supreme Court, but of course would be defeated. The essence of the Saturday Night Massacre 
was to scuttle an investigation about the abuse of, into the abuse of power by the U.S. President. The essence of President Trump's decision to fire FBI Director Comey, I believe very strongly, was to scuttle the investigation the very first time in American history in which the FBI has engaged in a counterterrorism investigation of a sitting president. That's right. The FBI has investigated previous presidents, but never have we had the FBI engaging in a counterterrorism investigation of a sitting president. That's about as serious as you can get. And the question arises, why did President Trump fire Comey? You've heard my conclusion. Let's look at the White House's explanation. <laughs> yesterday, yesterday, you may have seen the news, and you know that Vice President Pence went to Capitol Hill, that the Deputy White House Press Officer, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, explained the rationale. Rice Priebus, explained the rationale, and White House advisor Kellyanne Conway explained the rationale for the firing. Each one of them dutifully carried out the talking points of the White House. Yes, it was a strong, decisive action, but more than that, they said, the president simply responded to the recommendation from newly appointed Deputy Attorney General Ron Rothstein who apparently, after assuming office just 10 days ago, arrived at the conclusion that the FBI director who reports to Rothstein should go. A memo, it was said, went to the White House arguing the reasons why Comey should be removed from his position as director and the surrogates, one after the other, located in different places around Washington, said, that the president had no choice but to accept the recommendation from the deputy attorney general to fire Director Comey. That was the story from coast to coast for about 20 hours. And then we learned that that was not true. What instead was the truth was that President Trump had called the Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, and the Deputy Attorney General, Ron Rothstein, to the Oval Office, said to them, I'm going to fire Director Comey. I want you to write a memo to explain why I should do it. When word leaked by these surrogates, when word, rather, was released by the surrogates that the idea to fire Comey had come from the Deputy Attorney General, Ron Rothstein rightly hit the ceiling. He was very angry. He was about ready to resign because that representation was false. Today on the news, President Trump, in an interview with Lester Holt, the NBC anchor, said it was his idea. Now he's changed his story. In less than 24 hours, the White House has changed its story about whose idea it was to fire the director. The rationale behind the firing has changed as well. And so that leaves Americans wondering just what is the truth about the reason for firing Director Comey. Here's what we know. It was just a week ago, a simple week ago, that President Trump praised Director Comey, praised him, said he was doing a fine job, a fine professional. Less than a week later, the President of the United States fires the director, the very man that he was praising. What happened? Less than a week ago, you may know, Director Comey, in testimony to the Congressional Committee, was asked, is the President a subject of your investigation? He refused to deny that it was. Later that day, the FBI Director went to his supervisor, Deputy Attorney General Ron Rothstein, and said, I want to expand the investigation. I want more resources. I need more prosecutors. Rothstein, who has known Comey for a number of years, listened very carefully, 
He passed word on to the Attorney General of the United States, Jeff Sessions, who then presumably told President Trump that Comey is not willing to stop the investigation, but indeed is broadening the investigation, wants more prosecutors, which indicates they're moving toward criminal charges, wants more resources to expand, which means more people being brought in within the orbit of the investigation. That's when President Trump decided, we now know, that's when he decided that he would fire Director Comey, which is to say then, his rationale for firing Director Comey was not his statement in the interview today that Comey was doing a bad job, doing a lousy job, because remember, just a week ago, he said he was doing a great job, a fine professional. It was to scuttle the Russian investigation. We now find ourselves then in a very, very difficult situation. Questions, very important constitutional questions will arise as a result of this election, building up the pile of major constitutional issues that have already that have already arisen as a result of President Trump's actions in just 115 days since you all celebrated the passage of the new year. Mike Pence was lying to the American people yesterday when he said that President Trump was asked or he was instructed or he was directed or it was highly recommended. Choose your verb because Mike Pence changed his verb. That, that the Deputy Attorney General had strongly recommended the firing of Comey. Think of poor Mike Pence here for a second. This is the second time in less than 60 days that he's left to, to hang out to dry. First, lying about Mike Flynn in denying that Mike Flynn's infamous conversation with his Russian counterparts had ever involved the discussion of sanctions. We later learned that Pence was in fact lied to. Question arises whether President Trump had also lied to his vice president. There was Mike Pence embarrassed. Flynn was fired, we'll come back to that. Here we have yesterday. The president tells Mike Pence, go out and tell everybody that the de deputy attorney general had recommended that I should fire Comey. Now today, the president himself pulls the rug out from underneath his own vice president betrays whatever confidence exists between the two, leaves Mike Pence, the Vice President of the United States, in a very embarrassing position. We don't even need to ask how the other surrogates felt, Priebus and Conway and, of course, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, among others. They're accustomed to it. What kinds of issues now arise out of the dismissal? of Director Comey. Number one, the Attorney General of the United States, Jeff Sessions, is on the hot seat. Because you may remember that during his confirmation hearings before the Senate Judiciary Committee, that he did not disclose that during the campaign, he had had conversations with Russian officials. Later, when it was learned, he said he had forgotten. He was called back before the Judiciary Committee, asked to explain it. He said it just was an afterthought. He apologized, he forgot. But he did tell the Senate Judiciary Committee that he would recuse himself from all aspects of the investigation into Russia. Well, he just violated that pledge yesterday when, in fact, he became involved in the Russian investigation. He's on the hot seat. Let's see if the Senate Judiciary Committee calls him back, grills him as, as it should. The President of the United States is on the hot seat. If indeed we learn that for a fact that he fired Comey to scuttle the Russian investigation, that's obstruction of justice. That's abuse of power. Exactly what Richard Nixon was accused of and would have been impeached for had he not resigned the presidency in 1974. That's very, very serious business. 
It would be obstruction of justice. Why? Because the president knows, or did know, yesterday at least, that Director Comey was intensifying the investigation, asking for more resources. There was an effort to bring down the investigation or to slow it. How will we get to the point of knowing what Trump knew when he decided to act? That will have to be drawn out of the investigation. 115 days into his presidency, it appears to be the case that the President of the United States has obstructed justice, has obstructed an investigation, has abused his power, both of which would be impeachable offenses under the Constitution of the United States. There's more, much more. Former National Security Advisor Mike Flynn, who held the post for about 30 minutes, a little bit of an exaggeration, 30 days or so, who was, of course, fired by President Trump, asked the Senate Intelligence Committee for immunity so that he could testify. His lawyer said, Flynn has a story to tell. Oh, boy, does he have a story to tell. The Senate Intelligence Committee refused at that point to grant immunity because it wanted to wait until, it's, until it built up a file, built up a case to ensure that if and when, if and when it granted immunity to Mike Flynn, it was sure that he had a story to tell. You only grant immunity to somebody if you want to catch a bigger fish. Who's a bigger fish than the National Security Advisor? There's only one person, and that's the President of the United States. Flynn was asked to turn over some documents relative to his conversations with Russian officials. He refused to do that. Two days ago, the Senate Intelligence Committee issued a subpoena to him. The White House is very nervous about what General Mike Flynn might say. Mike Flynn wants immunity because he could be prosecuted for violating several statutes. Potentially, the investigation into his activities could lead to charges of treason. Very serious business. A question arises. Will the President of the United States now attempt to invoke executive privilege to block Mike Flynn's testimony? There's a good chance that could happen. After all, the White House did at one point invoke executive privilege to stop Sally Yates, for a short time, the acting attorney general, from testifying, and then it gave up the ghost. Will it in attempt to invoke executive privilege, the assertion of presidential power to prohibit an aide from testifying or to prohibit an aide from supplying information, documents, memos relevant to the congressional investigation? President Nixon tried that for a time, which led to the great Supreme Court case, a landmark decision in 1974 called United States versus Nixon, which is when the Supreme Court of the United States rejected President Nixon's assertion of an absolute executive privilege and ordered him to turn over the Watergate tapes. If President Trump attempts to invoke executive privilege to stop Mike Flynn, now we've got a constitutional conflict. Congress has very broad authority to conduct investigations, including the subpoena power. The president's assertion of executive privilege has been upheld by courts, but it's limited. This could lead to a court case, or, or if the Senate Intelligence Committee really wants the information, and it has the support of the majority leader, the Senate could ratchet up its demand by threatening some of President Trump's favorite projects, cutting off money, denying funds, or going to the ultimate level of threatening impeachment. President Trump may well invoke executive privilege to stop Mike Flynn from testifying on the assumption that yes, as his attorney said, he's got a story to tell, which in theory would include some details about President Trump's knowledge of the communications between his campaign team and Russian officials, or perhaps direct conversations between President Trump and Russian officials. Who knows? We don't know, but if he has a story, 
It's likely to involve some communication that at a minimum Trump was aware of and perhaps even authorized. President Trump could protect Mike Flynn from testifying. Yes, he could. Tomorrow he could grant a pardon to Mike Flynn for any and all offenses that he may have committed against the United States from a previous date. The president's pardon power is a sweeping authority. Very few checks, very, very few limitations on it. If President Trump wants to behave in a very aggressive way, he could pardon Mike Flynn. A pardon protects somebody from a jail sentence, from legal punishment. You might wonder, well, this is just testimony before a congressional committee. How does a pardon reach Mike Flynn and protect him? Because Flynn could say to the Senate, got a pardon, see the card? This is a get out of jail free card. I'm not testifying. The Senate could, could try to hold him in contempt of Congress, but it would be in vain because ultimately he could not be punished for, quote, any offenses that he's committed against the United States from a particular date. That was the nature of the pardon, you may recall, that President Gerald Ford granted to former President Richard Nixon for all offenses that he may have committed against the United States since 1968. Some wondered should it be since he was born, but he just wrote <laughs> since 1968. So what if President Trump went in that direction to prevent Mike Flynn from testifying. The only response that Congress could produce to overcome that would be to impeach President Trump or to threaten to impeach him. If you issue the pardon, we will impeach you. Why? Because under Article II of the Constitution, the President's pardon power extends to all offenses against the United States except in cases of impeachment. Can you imagine the heat, the intensity in Washington if President Trump started going down this path to stop Flynn, ultimately decided to grant a pardon, would Congress then respond by threatening to impeach the President? Stay tuned on that. Others will, will be asked to testify. Certainly Sally Yates will be coming back, and Director Comey, you can be sure, will be testifying. Freed from his position, he might feel liberated, uninhibited, willing to talk a great deal about the nature of the investigation, although he is a Boy Scout, refusing to divulge any classified information. You can be sure about that. He's a Boy Scout. Why do we say he's a Boy Scout? Today, in testimony before the Senate Intelligence Committee, the newly appointed acting attorney general, Andrew McCabe, was asked by a member of the committee, is it true, as the White House has said, that Director Comey had no support within the FBI, no fans there within the FBI? And McCabe said, that's not true, that he is highly, to this day, highly, highly admired and respected, overwhelmingly popular, he said, with the vast majority of the people who work at the FBI. That was a very bold, direct, candid rebuke of the White House line that Comey had to go. You might have heard Mike Pence saying this, another unfortunate remark by poor Mike Pence, saying that Comey had lost the confidence of the FBI and he had to go the confidence of the FBI, and the confidence of the American people. I don't, I don't recall polls among the American people, how do you feel about James Comey today, but that was the assertion. And then McCabe was also asked by a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, is it true, as the White House has said, that the Russian investigation is just an ins one of the many insignificant matters on the FBI's plate, as if nobody really is thinking about it or paying attention. McCabe, again, very forthrightly, very boldly said, not true. It's one of the most significant things we're doing. 
And then he said, and this had to send chills into the White House, he said, you can be sure that the FBI will do its job. It will not be undeterred by any political pressure, any political force, to which a member of the Intelligence Committee said, glad to hear that. You let us know if you get any pressure from the White House. So here is a very stern rebuke of the White House by the person that the president thought would be kinder to the White House than the man he, the president had just fired. Stay tuned on that. Jared Kushner, have you heard of Jared Kushner? <laughs> In January, he volunteered to testify before the Senate Intelligence Committee because he had nothing to hide. At that point, the committee said, thanks, but no thanks. We're gonna wait till we have a predicate. We'll have a list of questions for you, but not yet. Kushner will be called back. We'll be called to testify. If he refuses, he'll be subpoenaed. What's the value of Jared Kushner's testimony? Well, he's right there in the White House. It's almost as though he's at the president's table, so to speak, breaking bread. So there will be others who will be asked to testify. All of this, these, these uh, these acts of testimony from White House aides and advisors, coupled with others, will bring more heat on the president. Now, if it's true, if it's true, as President Trump says, that he had no interaction with the, F with the Russian officials, that he had severe doubts that anybody on his team had had any discussions, conversations, that nobody on his team had colluded, if, 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 that's true. The best way to clear President Trump and his team is to fully cooperate with these committees, but he can do one better. He could agree that a special prosecutor should be appointed. That's if he has nothing to hide, he should join the chorus of voices, the rising chorus of voices, asking for the appointment of a special prosecutor, if he has nothing to hide. The problem with not having an independent counsel conduct an investigation is this. Since both the House and the Senate Intelligence Committees are controlled by GOP leadership, because they dominate both chambers, as you know, it means that if the investigations go on for months and they conclude that they're was no collusion, no cooperation between the Trump team and Russian officials. Americans will be in a state of disbelief because of the partisan nature of the control over those committees. And thus there will always be a shadow hanging over President Trump and Republicans as they face the midterms in 2018 and the next presidential election in 2020. And even if it's true Let's assume it's true for a moment that there was no collusion and the, investigate, and the investigatory committees reached that conclusion. Pity them because there'll still be a great deal of doubt. But if on the other hand, an independent counsel was appointed, fully staffed, supported by adequate resources, given access to all the documents and the witnesses that he or she needs, and then that special prosecutor reaches the conclusion that there was no collusion, no funny business, then there would not be that shadow hanging over Trump, hanging over the Republicans, indeed hanging over the country. So for peace of mind, for some sense of conclusion grounded in evidence, it serves the nation well if in fact we have an independent counsel. And if President Trump believes that his team has clean hands, engaged in no wrongdoing, he ought to join that chorus of voices demanding the appointment of an independent counsel. Stay tuned on all of that, because we could have new news by 11 tonight, <laughs> thus making all my remarks irrelevant in about three hours. Before I even thought about talking about that, I actually had prepared remarks on many other subjects that have arisen involving the President and the Constitution since January 20. Let's review those in short order, and then I'll love to take your questions. 
you all know that one of President Trump's first acts was to issue an executive order to ban immigration because he said Muslims threaten national security. He and his aides talked openly, talked publicly that this was a Muslim ban. You know that the executive order was held unconstitutional by a federal judge in Seattle. It was held unconstitutional by another judge. Trump blasted the federal judge in personal terms, which is his want, in the same way that he had attempted to, dis to discredit the federal judge of Mexican heritage. You recall, he's a Mexican, he can't be objective. It wasn't enough to simply say he disagreed, but that in this case, the judges that banned, that struck down the executive order would have blood on their hands if in fact an immigrant came to the United States and did harm. Of course, the court saw through the rationale, the purported rationale. It was supposed to be a Muslim ban. It was supposed to be done in the name of national security. But oddly enough, a couple countries did not appear on that list. Saudi Arabia was not on that list. And yet, since 2001, Saudi Arabia has in one way or another exported more people than all the other nations combined has exported people who have done, who have inflicted harm on the United States. If the goal is really national security, you would put the Saudis on that list. The question arose, and the White House was asked, why, why, if the goal is national security, do you not have Saudi Arabia and Turkey on that list? The other nations, the other six nations, had not exported a single person who had inflicted any harm. The White House couldn't offer a good answer saying these were the nations that were on President Obama's terrorism watch list, so that's good enough for us, which is pretty ironic because in other cases, nothing that the Obama administration does is good enough for us. But skeptics wondered about the names of countries on that list and pointed out that President Trump has businesses in Saudi Arabia and in Turkey. Could that have possibly been a factor? I'm just asking. <laughs> the next executive order was virtually the same, still did not include Saudi Arabia and Turkey on that country. The Trump administration had hoped to have a better shot with the federal judges in this case, lost again. You remember a Hawaiian judge shut it down, a Maryland federal judge shut it down. In the process, federal Trump, Fed, President Trump attacked the Ninth Circuit for its ruling, not knowing apparently that it was a federal judge, federal district judge, not the Ninth Circuit. That doesn't seem to matter. But the courts took a very interesting turn, which is to say that they took seriously the president's words. Going back months, when President Trump had said publicly in speech after speech that Muslims represent a major security threat to the United States and that he wanted to ban them from traveling to the country, those federal judges took the president at his word. As if, what a remarkable thought here, as if the president's word should be taken seriously. Defenders of President Trump said, well, don't take him literally. <laughs> well, that creates a problem for us and for the courts. Well, when should we take his word seriously? On Tuesday, but not Wednesday? Thursday, but not Friday? That's a major dilemma. And one thing that really torpedoed the second executive order were the words of Stephen Miller, another White House advisor who told uh, Fox News, that the second order will be the same as the first. It will be a Muslim ban. We'll just tidy up some language to clear away some technical legal problems. The judge cited those words. You might remember it was the same Stephen Miller who responded publicly in the wake of the first judicial rejection of President Trump's order by saying, quote, the president's national security decisions will not be questioned. 
will not be questioned. Those are pretty chilling words. Because nobody in American history has asserted an absolutist claim for presidential power and national security, even though there have been very broad claims, to be sure, by a number of presidents on both sides of the aisle. This is not a partisan attack. But nobody's asserted an absolute power as Stephen Miller did. And yet anybody can look at the text of the Constitution. You're probably all carrying your Constitution. Just pull it out right now. You would see that, in fact, in Article I of the Constitution, Congress is given the lion's share of foreign policy and national security powers. Congress, not the president. So even if the assertion was going to be made that the president has absolute power, there's a little bit of a problem with the text of the Constitution. And then if you look deeper and you probe the discussions and debates in the Constitutional Convention, you would see, in fact, that the framers of the Constitution were unanimously opposed to the idea of giving the president the authority to take the nation into war. Nobody spoke on behalf of a unilateral presidential war-making power. Wait a minute, let me be honest and full and thorough here, because you owe, you're owed that. On August 17, the second and last date of debate on the war clause in the Constitutional Convention, August 17, 1787, one of the delegates, a man named Pierce Butler, a delegate from Georgia, began the day by saying, I think the president should be given the war power because he would never use it unless our national security required it. Immediately, several delegates piled on, figuratively, not literally. They rejected his position. Several said, I never thought I would hear in a republic the argument that the president would have the war power. By the end of that day, give credit to Pierce Butler for beating a quick retreat. At the end of the day, he introduced a motion that said, just as Congress alone has the authority to take us to war, so too does Congress have the exclusive authority to withdraw us from war. He had done a complete about face. A few months later, in the Georgia ratifying convention, he told his colleagues, well, there was one fellow in the Constitutional Convention who had had the temerity to propose that the president should be vested with the unilateral authority to go to war. He said, but that idea was quickly rejected. He never acknowledged he was that fellow. <clears throat> so if you look at the discussions and debates in Philadelphia, folks, you see that the framers never entertained the idea that the president would have the war-making power, never even entertained the idea or even flirted with the idea that the president would have the authority to conduct foreign affairs all by himself. The treaty-making power was intended to be the primary vehicle for the conduct of American foreign policy. So Stephen Miller and others in the White House that wanted to make that very bold, brash, claim that the president's discussions will not be questioned, the very sound of which echoes from the 1930s in European countries where we had dictators and fascist leaders. No basis for those assertions. We have a president who has acted unconstitutionally from the day he took his oath of office. How many of you have heard of the emoluments clause? We have now, but did you ever hear about it? Have you ever heard about it before President Trump came into office? Probably not. It was one of those arcane parts of the Constitution that had seemingly never been discussed because there was no reason to discuss it. What's the emoluments clause say in Article I? It prohibits the president or other officers from receiving compensation, salaries, gifts, emoluments from foreign governments. Why is it there? Because at the Constitutional Convention, as the framers constructed that clause, they said, we're very familiar with the practice of foreign governments trying to bribe our ambassadors. It was a universal problem. A couple of the framers remarked that this had happened to Ben Franklin when he was ambassador to Paris, that in fact, King Louis had 
attempted to bribe Ben Franklin as he had others by giving all of the ambassadors a wonderful portrait of himself, a beautiful painting. And as the framer said on the floor, they all gleefully accepted, happily accepted the portrait. And then as soon as they took it home, they proceeded to remove the diamonds that surrounded the portrait, kept the diamonds, threw away the portrait. It was the effort to bribe ambassadors. And it was also stated that, in fact, John Adams, ambassador on, for the United States in London, sometimes in Spain, had been uh, the recipient of a horse. King Philip of Spain had tried to bribe John Adams. And so the point was, the framers did not want the president to be able to accept any compensation, any salary, any emoluments from a foreign government because they greatly feared foreign meddling, foreign intervention, and particularly bribery. It might be difficult for us at this point in American history to understand that the framers lived in dread fear of the possibility of foreign bribes, and those fears coursed their way through the discussion in the summer of 1787 and had a great impact on the framers' construction of various parts of the Constitution as they allocated power. The treaty-making power, for example, reflected the concern that it would be very difficult for a foreign government to bribe a full Senate or a majority of the Senate, and thus that's why the Senate, one of the reasons why the Senate would be added to the treaty-making power with the President. James Madison, James Wilson, Ben Franklin, many of them spoke about the possibility of efforts by foreign governments to bribe American officials. That's why the Emoluments Clause is there. So how has President Trump been in violation of it since January 20? Every time a foreign governmental official books a room at one of his hotels or leases a suite of offices, that's money that goes from the foreign government into the Trump, the Trump family business, ultimately into his pocket. It enriches his business interests. He could have avoided this if he had sold off all of his interests or placed them in a blind trust, but of course you know he refused to do that. And given the fact that on almost a daily basis, almost a daily basis, some foreign governmental officials or others are indeed doing business with Trump's hotels then you know that the number of violations easily exceeds dozens of constitutional violations. As one Chinese official said, it would be rude for us to come to Washington and not stay in the president's hotel down the block from the White House. What to do about that? Congress could grant a waiver so that President Trump's not in violation, or Congress could do, and if it doesn't grant a waiver, it should do its duty and start a serious investigation into what is an impeachable offense. There are two cases challenging the, uh, the fact that President Trump's family businesses are receiving money from foreign officials as a violation of the Emoluments Clause. We'll see where those, where those lawsuits go. Among other constitutional violations, you may be aware that President Trump ordered the attack on Syrian airfields, 59 missiles. The president had no legal, no constitutional authority to do that. Congress has the war power, and yes, it's true that many of his predecessors, going back to Harry Truman, have indeed violated the war clause, but repeated violation does not justify or legalize the violation itself. I always love the witty old English judge who observed governmental practice. He said, quote, governmental practice is of no proof of legality. It's no proof of legality. So ladies and gentlemen, those are just a few of the examples of President Trump's actions. There are others that we could discuss that violate the Constitution that may turn out to represent very consequential actions and results for his administration. It's hard to believe that at this early date in the Trump presidency, 115 days or so into it, that we face such consequential 
constitutional issues, that we face the possibility that the president's team colluded with Russian officials. It would be heartbreaking if we learned that's the truth because as I said earlier, it would undermine the essence of our democracy. It would undermine the idea that our election should be free and fair. It would undermine America's sovereignty. And worse yet, we know that the Russians' actions are ongoing, which leads us all to wonder, why is it that President Trump can virtually ignore some of our closest allies when they come to visit him, whether it's the Australian Prime Minister, whether it's Angela Merkel of Germany, refused to shake hands with Angela Merkel in front of the cameras, and yet he engages in this bromance with two Russian officials, the Foreign Minister and the Russian Ambassador in the Oval Office yesterday. And oh, by the way, admitting the Russian photojournalists, but excluding American journalists in the Oval Office. Why is it that he can't bring himself to criticize Putin, but he can criticize our closest allies? Questions inquiring minds want to know. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Adler. We're going to open the floor up to questions here. Uh, my compatriot, uh, Mike uh, uh, Patrick, from the, uh, the editor of the Coeur d'Alene Press, is going to be in charge of the mic here. I do want to remind you that we are here to uh, hear uh, Dr. Adler speak, so please make them questions <laughs> and not speeches. And I will turn the mic over to uh, Mike. And thank you, Dr. Adler. Now, for those of you who have been here before, and many of you have, we do this kind of Phil Donahue style. Raise your hand if you have a question. As my friend David said, we really aren't interested in your speeches or your philosophies, uh, but this is a time to ask good, tough questions. You had your hand up first. And give your name, please. My name is Steve Cedros. Um, Thank you, Dr. Adler, for bringing the real information to us up here. Um, Thank you. Question is, uh, in your most recent presentation here at NIC just shortly ago, you mentioned that Congress had ceded their authority to the president. Can they simply, uh, is it just a matter of them exercising that? Or is there a process that they needed to go through to regain that power? That's an excellent question. Thank you very much. The reality is, is that uh, when we talk about the fact that Congress has acquiesced in the face of presidential usurpation of the war power or other, other parts of its constitutional package, that we point out that Congress may not, may not delegate away its constitutional powers. It cannot delegate away the lawmaking power, the appropriations power, the war power, any of its constitutional powers. The doctrine of separation of powers has a fundamental predicate, and that is that while it's true that no branch of government may usurp, that is, steal the power of other branches, it's equally true that no branch may, may surrender its constitutional powers. Why is that? Because if we want to shift powers from one branch to another, if Congress truly wants to give the president the war power, then Congress needs to undertake that shift through the amendatory clause in Article 5 of the Constitution. The Constitution was not written for Congress, and even if members don't want to exercise responsibility over the crucial decisions on national security and foreign affairs and war making, the reality is it has no authority to delegate it away. That's prohibited by what we call the delegation doctrine. But Congress, and you rightly remember, thank you very much, but Congress has, for many years, acquiesced in the face of presidential usurpation of power, and on occasion has written some very bad laws, the War Powers Act of 1973, the uh, 
act shortly after the attack on America in, in uh, 2001, among other statutes in which Congress seemingly has given away the war power. It has no authority to do that. It's time for Congress to reassert its constitutional responsibilities and duties. And we might ask, why would Congress surrender its responsibilities and duties and powers? Why would anybody want to run for Congress or serve in Congress if they're simply going to give away the store? Thank you. We're going to take a question from Dr. Norman Leffler. Hmm. Dr. Leffler? You're probably not going to like this question, but I'm going to hold on to the oh, microphone. Okay, just, okay. Just so Thank you. No but but here, here's what I'd like to say. You're obviously a liberal Democrat, and I'm not, and so we have a different view and thing. And you have, I've listened to what you've had to say, and I'm not going to go through all of it or preach anything, but you've given a lot of half truths of what you, you've said. Now, since you were talking about constitutional law. How many constitutional laws did President Obama break, or can you criticize at all? And th there were a lot of Republicans that criticized him for, for a lot of things that he did during his presidency. And I might say, on top of all this, uh, this is the beginning of the Trump presidency, and you've already convicted him. I, I, I mean, he may, be, he may have done wrong. Don't so the, so the question, Dr. Yeah, Adler? I think it's wrong as a legal scholar that you should convict him already when he hadn't even been tried. Okay, but thank but you. I did thank hear a question you. in there. I, pre I appreciate your comments. Thank you very much. I, I, I'm not bothered at all uh, by your challenge. I appreciate that. So I would say, sir, in previous years when I've been here, I, I did in fact criticize President Obama for his violations of the Constitution. Tonight's talk was not about Obama, but I've done that in the past. In, and you should also know, in various books and articles, I probably criticized as many Democrats or more so than Republicans. So, written a number of pieces, books and articles criticizing Bill Clinton for his violation of the Constitution, President Obama, President Johnson, President Truman. So I would say that over the course of my career, uh, Democratic presidents have been the targets of criticism as often or more often. So yours is a very good question, sir, and I appreciate that. Uh, as a legal scholar, I don't play favorites. And in fact, that's probably why I don't have any friends, because they <laughs> criticize everybody, right? Uh, so it's important to me as a constitutional scholar to maintain that detachment, scholarly objectivity. And so uh, across the years, uh, too many years to count now, I've written critically of, of Democratic presidents because we should. We should criticize presidents regardless of party, regardless of party affiliation when they deserve it because I think it's wrong to cherry pick. I don't like when Republicans cherry pick. I don't like it when Democrats cherry pick. And so the reality is I think that's incumbent upon me, as you point out, as a legal scholar to do that. Now when I indict Trump at this point, let us say, as, as I pointed out earlier, let's say he's absolved of any or all wrongdoing, no collusion, no cooperation. Uh, if that's true, then we could all breathe a sigh of relief. If we know in 200 days that there was no monkey business, I think we'd all feel better about it. I certainly would. So that, those are my remarks on the facts as they exist now, and if, in fact, uh, later we learn after a very important, thorough investigation that President Trump and his team are exonerated of these accusations, then I would say, I would say publicly, good for them that they won this election without foreign intervention. So uh, thank you for your challenge. That's important. Yes, please. No, no we're, we're, we're moving on now. Ma'am? Yes, yes, oh. he did. He, he, well, yes, I'd, I'd like to answer the question. Just a second. Thanks, Mike. Oh, oh, gotcha. Oh, so, and I said, yes, I said in years past, I've criticized Obama both in print and speeches. So, among other things, he engaged in an unconstitutional act of war making in Libya, for example. That was very clear. He exceeded his authority with respect to the appointments of people to some committees. The Supreme Court rebuked him. Just two primary examples. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and your name, ma'am? I'm Lisa Nunless. Under what circumstances might the tax records be subpoenaed? 
That's an excellent question. It, it's, it's my view that if the work of both committees is truly serious uh, and they get to the question of asking about ties, alleged ties between Russian officials and the Trump campaign team, uh, that they're going to raise the question uh, about Trump's motives as to why he's unwilling to criticize uh, President Putin, what's the nature of his relations with Russia, if any, that the committees are going to have to subpoena his tax records. Because as we've heard many, many times, that's how we'll know if he's beholden to any Russian businessman, to the Russian oligarchs, as people have suggested. So if we see those uh, if we want to know the truth about his business connections, that's when we'll see them. And yes, the, both committees have the subpoena power. They could subpoena them. The question is, would President Trump then try to invoke executive privilege to block it, leading to a likely court case, but the court has upheld the subpoena power, again going back to the Nixon case, the courts would side with Congress. So here's a real test of partisanship because we know how emphatically President Trump has refused to turn over the records, the last thing he wants to do, but if Congress is serious, it will subpoena those records. Thank you. Okay, Paula. Okay, my name is Paula Niels. My question, and I maybe should know this answer, but I don't, uh, who will choose the special investigator for it? Thank you, that's a very good question to ask. So the truth is, is that it would be Deputy Attorney General Ron Rothstein, the same person who in one way or another was implicated in the firing of Director Comey. So at this point, as you may know, uh, Democrats in Congress are calling for the appointment of a special prosecutor. Thus far, we've not heard from uh, Rothstein. It might be the case that he'll feel a lot of pressure if more Republicans add their voices to that demand. And it may be the case that because he was so angry that he was fingered as the person who had said to President Trump, you need to fire James Comey, that he might just say, enough is enough. I want this monkey off my back so as to preserve my integrity and make the appointment. If he makes the appointment, then he'll take great heat from President Trump. And we know that President Trump uh, uh, responds to comments on TV. We know from aides on an anonymous basis that he yells at the television. It's probably just Tourette's. More Americans have Tourette's these days than ever before, I think, yes. It's contagious. Thank In you. In the back, next, please. Mm -hmm. Next question. Uh, Terry Montaigne, Coeur d'Alene. Uh, thank you, Dr. Adler. I also was at the uh, uh, your talk at NIC. Oh, thank you. And as usual, I thought of my question a couple days after you were gone. <laughs> so well, I'm, I'm glad you ask, came back. I'm going to ask the question now. You, uh, you had a, a kind of a cheat sheet that you handed out about uh, legislative duties, uh, uh, judicial duties, and executive duties as spelled out in the Constitution. And frankly, I was shocked at the number of duties th that the legislative branch has. And I was amazed that they had that many that they don't seem to exercise. So here's my question. Why? Why don't they exercise them? And I ask you because uh, you hear all kinds of cynical or pessimistic answers as to why that is. Uh, but I would like your opinion as to what has happened over the years that uh, these, these duties have, have been ceded to the executive branch. That's an excellent question, a, a, a question of great moment uh, in our constitutional republic. So I'll need another five or six hours to answer that. Um, I've written on this over the years and addressed this, uh, and there are a number of factors. Uh, the shift, if we, if we focus on foreign affairs and national security and war making for just a moment, the shift from congressional decision making as uh, the primary role of Congress making those decisions began at the end of World War II with the onset of the Cold War. In the climate of the Cold War, uh, presidents uh, argued that they should not be handcuffed in the face of the threat posed by the Soviet bogeyman. To handcuff the president, to deny him the opportunity to act on a moment's notice to protect our national security, could constitute a grave peril to our national security. 
And so with that policy argument, members of Congress in this climate of the Cold War with rising fear of the Soviets, often stoked by politicians for their own ends, in that fear, in that realm, uh, which was dominated by fear of the Soviets, fewer and fewer members of Congress were willing to challenge broad assertions of presidential power for fear of either handcuffing the president uh, when he might need to act at a moment's notice to preserve our national security, but just as, as just as importantly, or if not more so, they did not want to be labeled as soft on communism. To be labeled as soft on communism in the period of McCarthyism was that proverbial silver bullet. Could be the end of political careers, and indeed, members of Congress across the country were defeated when they were effectively painted as soft on communism. In addition to that, beginning with President Truman, a Democrat, the, it was the case that President Truman began to assert broader and broader war making and national security powers as a means of carrying out the policy uh, that he should be able to act on a moment's notice. In, when the outbreak, with the outbreak of the Korean War, the Secretary of State Dean Acheson, who was one of the nation's premier uh, legal, uh, premier uh, lawyers, was testifying before a committee, and a member of the committee said, do you believe that the president has this authority to go to war when the Constitution gives that authority to Congress? The preeminent attorney said, at a time like this, the question of who has what authority to do what is immaterial, pointing out that the ends justify the means. And that marked a point then where many scholars, many lawyers, many across the country began to support the idea that a president should wield unilateral authority uh, in the area of war making and national security. It may surprise you to know that among the very few members of the Senate to even uh, challenge President Truman on his assertion of unilateral authority to go to war, and he indeed was the first president to make that argument, one of them was Richard Nixon, who at that point rightly pointed out that the president has no authority to go to war. Now it's true, Nixon changed his mind a few years later when he became president. So what occurred in that early period, and I'm giving you the truncated version here, what occurred in that early period continued throughout the entire Cold War, and then you add, so you've got the policy arguments, you've got some constitutional arguments, even though they're made in vain, they could be torn apart very easily, but then you add in the political dimension, that members of Congress began to realize that participating in foreign affairs and national security issues could actually be harmful to their longevity. And the turning point for this really occurred in 1980, where you might recall the Idaho Senator Frank Church was defeated uh, over an argument principally involving the Panama Canal Treaty. President Reagan defeated Jimmy Carter, attacking Carter for doing business with a tin horde dictator, unwilling to take back American property, that's how he characterized it, it was Panamadian property nonetheless. And so members of Congress began to learn a lesson that maybe they're better off if they don't participate in decision making on foreign affairs and national security, despite the long list of powers, as you point out, in Article I actually giving Congress that authority. And they learned that they could place more resources into other areas of responsibility, constituent service and so forth. Once they learned this lesson, then it was easier for them politically to stand on the sidelines, so to speak. And this wouldn't be true of all members, of course. Some members serve in districts or states where it's expected that members would participate. But for the vast majority, they learned if they stand on the sidelines, then they can respond to a president's foreign policy action. If all goes well and the constituents like the president's action, they can say, I'm with the president. If the president takes an action and things go south, what can the member say? I told him so. I was critical, wrong decision. So I hope that doesn't sound cynical, and the only reason I offer this conclusion is because I've talked to dozens of members of Congress of both parties 
over the years because I have ha I've had the same question that you do. Sometimes it keeps me up at night uh, because it's a gross dereliction of congressional responsibility and uh, frankly I'm dismayed by the fact that members continue to defer to presidential aggrandizement of power uh, and once more I would say why run for office if you're not willing to discharge your duties and responsibilities. It's a very short answer to a very good question. Thank you. Short answer. I thought you were going to go for four hours there for me. <laughs> okay, ma'am, your name and your threat. question, please. Uh, my name is Carolyn Mattoon, and I have kind of a two-part question. You talked about the advantages of having a special counsel or special prosecutor. Uh, I'd like your thoughts on uh, having an independent commission as well, and who would be responsible for setting up an independent con commission? Thank you. Great question. Uh, as you well know, uh, some people have called for one or the other, a special prosecutor, sometimes referred to as an independent counsel or an independent commission. Nothing wrong with having an independent commission, such as the sort that looked at 9-11. It takes longer. It may not be given the subpoena power. Uh, I prefer an independent counsel, despite the fact that historically there have been some warts attached to some of the investigations, uh, but I prefer it because the independent counsel can move more swiftly. She or he will have uh, a full staff of attorneys and investigators, including the subpoena power, all the resources uh, that the special prosecutor needs to move more quickly. I would say that in addition to that, if we desire an independent counsel, excuse me, an independent commission, that's fine as well. So, uh, I, but I think a special prosecutor is to be preferred. So the DOJ, the rather the Deputy Attorney General, would appoint the special prosecutor, as we mentioned, for an independent commission. That can simply be Congress deciding to create one, and that would mean the majority leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, and the House Speaker, uh, Paul Ryan. Thank you for those good questions. Thank you. Jeff Carr. I would like to move to the First Amendment. Um, President Trump has sort of ex been quite critical of the American news media. I was just wondering if there was any historical precedent for that and your opinions on yeah. the American uh, news coverage of President Trump. Yes, thank you very much. I had intended to talk about that if I had not devoted 40 minutes to the, to the, newly, to the new problems arising in the last 48 hours. Yes, that distresses me to no end. Uh, first of all, because the concept of a free press is a powerful pillar of our free society. It is crucial to the welfare and maintenance of our republic. President Trump's attacks on the press, as I say, are dismaying, and they threaten to undermine one of the key pillars of our system. Obviously, the rule of law, transparency, accountability in government, and a free press. And if you think about why the free press is so critical uh, to our democracy, uh, Thomas Jefferson said it so nicely. You may have heard that quote before when he, was, when he wrote that if he had to choose between having newspapers without a government or a government without newspapers, he would prefer to have newspapers without a government. Why? Because at least then the people would be informed. Why is it so important for the people to be informed, to have knowledge about their government? Because in our democracy, where the sovereign people have the right, and many of us believe the duty, to monitor governmental actions, to speak out, to critique, to criticize where necessary as a means of holding government accountable, Governmental accountability is crucial to our system. If the people are denied a free press, then in fact our ability to behave as Madisonian monitors will in, in fact become very, very difficult. That's why we say the free press is in fact often referred to as the people's right to know. And I believe that truly. As a, as a former journalist, so that means I left one corrupt industry for another. <laughs> As a former journalist, I still bleed ink, I think. So thank you for asking that question. Thank you. And my wife, Cholet, will be taking subscriptions immediately after the lecture tonight. <laughs> Good. Okay, next question is from uh, former State Representative George Saylor. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mike. And Dr. Adler, my question really is about the status of the Constitution itself. 
it's been said that it's a document that was intended to be informally amended, or at least uh, could be, and the document itself seems to imply that, for example, like the necessary and proper clause does. And I'm wondering, in your opinion, uh, considering what you've said about Congress ceding their powers and the President exceeding his powers, if you think it has been informally amended or twisted so far that it's no longer serving us uh, properly or uh, serving as a viable document for us? Thank you. Th that's a very good question. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I, as a constitutional scholar, I'm very concerned about the status of the Constitution from a variety of perspectives. We've already mentioned that in the area of, of national security and foreign affairs and war making, that the constitutional allocation of power has been disfigured by presidents of both parties who have usurped or aggrandized congressional power. Uh, that seems very clear. Uh, that that uh, bothers me a great deal. Uh, but we've also seen uh, actions in other areas that uh, undermine the Constitution. So uh, as scholars have observed, the rulings by federal courts, including the Supreme Court on the Fourth Amendment, has converted the Fourth Amendment into Swiss cheese. So many of the protections now have gone missing. I think that the unwillingness of the court to uphold privacy concerns is a major problem. The fact that, in, that uh, the court, I believe, has, let me say this, about a non-controversial issue, that the court got it wrong on the Second Amendment case, that in fact, uh, in fact there is no, certainly no Second Amendment right for people to keep and bear arms. As I explained here a couple of years ago, the reality is, is the Second Amendment was designed so as to allow people to own guns so that at a moment's notice they could run out into the public square and defend the village from a foreign attack, usually an Indian attack. That was the design. That does not mean, of course, that statutorily individuals cannot be granted uh, broad freedom to keep and bear arms, but the Second Amendment is not the repository, so I think the court got it wrong there. As long as I'm criticizing the court, let me continue to ride that horse. The court, I think, was terribly wrong in the Citizens United case, terribly wrong in Hobby Lobby, attributing to corporations the very religious rights enjoyed by individuals was an exercise in what we would call conservative judicial activism. I use that term pointedly because so often, as you may know, uh, liberals are accused of engaging in liberal judicial activism. The truth is, it's just as easy for conservative judges to engage in judicial activism. And in fact, if you look at the sweep of our judicial record, you can find periods in which uh, liberals engage in judicial activism on the court, just as conservatives have engaged in judicial activism. So that's an example, in my view, of judges exceeding their authority. So if I indict all three branches of government, that the president usurps power, Congress acquiesces in the face of usurpation of power, and the courts too often acquiesce in the face of the of presidential usurpation of power, we're left to wonder, Who's minding the store? Who's protecting the integrity of the Constitution? So that's a very good question. We could talk endlessly about that. Thanks for asking. Mm -hmm. All right, Steve Meyer. My name is Steve Meyer. Dr. Adler, thank you for coming. You, We're all offended by the possibility of meddling in our elections by the Russians or others. Yet American foreign policy has meddled with the elections in other countries for three or four decades in the in the advocacy that our democratic system is better than whatever system exists in those places. Of course, the best example is Central America. Yes, that's right. So thank you. Uh, it's okay when we do it. It's not okay when other nations do it. Exactly. Uh, no, so, so here's the, so you're exactly right. Steve makes a very good point. The reality is, is that all nations attempt to meddle to some degree. It's when that meddling threatens to affect the outcome of our elections that we become very concerned. So it's a little bit of a cat and mouse game that all nations play, trying to affect different nations. This is the first time that 
it was operationalized against the United States, so we naturally take offense. So your point, I think, might well be that we ought not to meddle elsewhere. And, and when you point out about our meddling in South America, of course, we are all familiar with President Nixon's uh, overthrow of the democratically elected president in Chile, Allende. We recognize President Reagan's uh, allocation of resources to overthrow the democratically elected Sandinistas in Nicaragua, Nicaragua which spawned the Iran-Contra affair. Uh, we always say that gentlemen don't open other people's mail. We have a lot of people that read other people's mail. <laughs> so you raise a very important question about principle here. So we can be principled except when we're not. When we find that our foremost foreign adversary has entered the waters here and has attempted to tilt the election toward President Trump, and we recognize just how severe that effort was, and we may yet learn just how extensive it was or successful it was, then it does give rise to enormous anger and frustration here. It may be the case, as you point out, that America should rethink how it conducts uh, some of its operations abroad so that we can speak with moral authority and not appear to be hypocritical, which is the point here. Uh, and there's so many areas in which America used to be that shining city on the hill. We used to champion international law. We used to champion human rights. We used to champion a variety of causes, and that's what helped this country to be viewed by many across the world as the greatest country on earth. But when we begin to waterboard, to torture, when we begin to disregard international law and human rights, we lose our moral authority. So it's time to reclaim that. Thank you for answering that question, for asking that question. Thank Dr. You. Adler, how are we doing on time? Great, let's go to midnight. <laughs> be good. You know, he, he would. I have a very lengthy <laughs> question. <too. laughs> okay, sir. Uh, my name is Bill Ward, Dr. Adler, thank you for being here. Thank I'd you. like to have a question concerning Michael Flynn. If President Trump should grant, grant executive privilege, would that recover or exempt Flynn from testimony prior to being the national security advice when he was with the campaign. Secondly, if he grants him a pardon, he's then free of punishment. Can he be compelled to testify since there is no penalty for whatever he, t he testifies to? Yeah, great questions, thank you very much. So first of all, yes, it would be very frustrating if President Trump were to pardon, let's say, Mike Flynn, or extend a pardon to Carter Page, uh, whom the administration denied even knowing even though President Trump in March of 2016 publicly named Carter Page as his most important foreign policy advisor. Uh, but if, you, if the president were to proceed to grant pardons, then the reality is, is that it would be very frustrating, it would anger many in the country, but he could scuttle the investigation. Because a pardon can be granted before trial, even before an offense is committed, in a sense. And Therefore, the only response by Congress would be to threaten impeachment against Trump for that. Um, and so the reason why Flynn could avoid testifying is because Congress would have no power to enforce him. If you're compelled, even if you're sent to jail, he has the get out of jail card. As to the scope of executive privilege, that's been very controversial. Um, my own view is that the president does not have any constitutionally based claim of executive privilege. Nothing in the text, nothing in the debates, nothing to indicate that the president should be able to withhold information from Congress. Why would the framers of the Constitution have given the president authority to withhold information when at that very point in time it had been well established in England that the king had no authority to withhold information from a parliamentary inquiry. So thus, if the framers had decided to give to the President of the United States the, the authority to withhold information or block testimony, it means the framers would have given a power to the President that the King did not have. And the creation of our presidency was all about denying monarchical powers the reality is there was no claim of executive privilege until 1954 
when President Eisenhower became the first to conjoin those two words, executive and privilege. He did it in reaction to Joseph McCarthy's excesses when McCarthy demanded, after attacking the Pentagon, after attacking virtually everybody, when he attacked the Pentagon and accused Eisenhower of harboring communists in the Pentagon, that raised Ike's ire. He said no, he probably said hell no, it's being the soldier, and he invoked executive privilege to deny the request by McCarthy. Americans applauded because he had been rightly perceived as a bully. When Eisenhower stood up to him, Americans uh, responded with applause. The problem was he let the genie out of the bottle. Then it would remain for subsequent presidents to, to decide when to employ executive privilege. As I mentioned earlier in the Watergate tapes case in 1964, the court rejected the claim of Nixon that he had an absolute executive privilege, but did hold for the first time that a president has a limited privilege. But when you read that opinion and you look at the footnotes, the court never said that the president's assertion of executive privilege extends to withholding information from Congress. A very important footnote, but everybody overlooks it. And because people have acted on the premise, acted in an exaggerated way, have acted on the premise that the president enjoys executive privilege, then we're off to the races and successive presidents have invoked it. Once more, it falls to Congress to reassert its powers, to defend its constitutional turf. It has the ultimate powers. It can always prevail, but the question with Congress always is does it have the will to succeed? Thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Adler, the president has decided that this will be the last question tonight, <laughs> okay. and it's coming from Jan. Hi, my name is Jan Studer, and I'm going to change the discussion a little bit, if we may, instead of um, about executive powers, but vice presidential powers, mm. because if something were to happen, if Tr uh, President Trump were to be impeached, we'd put uh, Vice President Pence, and I'm not so sure that he is just poor Vice President Pence. I mean, he was on the, he was working on the campaign, he was on the transition team, has he really been told these things and just believe them? I, if you could just address that a little bit for me, please. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Thank you very much. Uh, because that tends to level this field a little bit. You're right to ask whether Mike Pence is truly a novitiate. Is he innocent in all these matters? Or has he just been uh, walking the talk for President uh, Trump? But on this question of making a representation yesterday, about Deputy Attorney General, about the Attorney General uh, s presenting to the President the recommendation to fire Comey, and then to hear today Trump deny that that was the case, uh, that rug was pulled out from underneath Mike Pence. Um, but he's been around the block many times. As Governor of Indiana, as a member of the House, no, I think uh, that, how shall I say this, he very effectively carries out President Trump's arguments and actions and policies. So he does just what a president expects of a vice president to do. Trump insists on loyalty, we know that, insists on loyalty among all of his aides. And when he, in fact, said to Comey, I demand that you exhibit loyalty toward me, and Comey refused. And by the way, President Trump was untutored in knowing that historically there is deliberately space between the White House and the FBI director, because we need that. So the chief law enforcement of the, of the country, chief law enforcement officer of the country is not working for the president. When we've had that before, that was during the Watergate period, so it's very important. So, no, Pence is no innocent. He's no novitiate. Uh, sometimes he may be asked to, uh, to spread lies, uh, and then he has to decide if he can do it. In the past, um, cabinet members, for example, who were unwilling to carry out the policies or make the representations that the president asked them to make, as a matter of conscience, resigned office. Certainly Cyrus Vance, the Secretary of State under Jimmy Carter, did that. He couldn't with good conscience carry out 
uh, President Carter's action. So well, let's stay tuned on Mike Pence. You know, of course, that if, if President Trump were to be impeached, that Mike Pence would become president. A lot of Republicans wouldn't mind that because he's more ideologically, ideologically consistent, more ideologically conservative, so he's more in step with many members of Congress. So from their perspective, it might not be such a bad thing, except that impeachment would ground government to a halt. It would be tough to defend in the midterms in the 2020 presidential election. There's a lot of chaos right now in the executive branch, so we'll see. We'll see what happens over the next few days and weeks. Thank you for ans asking that question. Thank you. And I'd like to thank, on behalf of the, the press and the other sponsors for tonight's lecture, I, I would like to, to thank Dr. Adler and point out once again, this is the sixth time he has never used a note during these lectures. Um, now, Dr. Leffler might. <laughs> thank you, Mike. Thank you, and thank you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank My you, Dr. Pleasure. Adler. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Dr. Leffler might do some fact-checking after this, and that would be welcome. <laughs> it would. It would indeed. <laughs>